Good afternoon, <clears throat> or good morning if you're on the West Coast. Welcome to Queen's International Institute on Social Policy. Uh, my name is Keith Banting. I'm a professor emeritus in the School of Policy Studies at Queen's, and I'll be welcoming you as host today to the 20th International Institute on Social Policy. This is the 25th anniversary of this program, and at no time in the last two and a half decades has social policy been so prominent and so critical to the future of Canada and other OECD countries. The current crisis has exposed stark inequalities, the precarious nature of work for many, the lack of basic social security for many more. In effect, it's laid bare the fault lines in our social contract. And the purpose of this series of seminars is to think collectively about how Canada and other countries can think again about the critical building blocks of social policy, how we can learn from the crisis, and how to build back better. Now, to begin, although we're not in person on the Queen's campus, I wish to acknowledge that Queen's University is situated on the traditional Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee territories and we are grateful to be able to live and learn on these lands. Today is the fourth of nine moderated online sessions. <clears throat> Last week, our series launched with three great presentations designed to give a very broad overview of the post-COVID world. We started with a keynote from Darren Asimoglu, a second session in which we traced the pandemic's impacts uh, <clears throat> across different OECD countries and looked at the different policy responses of different OECD countries. And we had a third session which looked in particular at vulnerable groups who are at risk of being left behind in the pandemic context. All of these very broad theme setting sessions are available now on the conference website. So if you missed any of them, check them out. They're all worth your time. This week, we drilled down into critical policy domains. Today, we're spotlighting rethinking income protection. The disruption and hardship caused by the 2020 crisis is heightening concerns about gaps in coverage, in inequities and inefficiencies in the current patchwork of income security programs in Canada and other OECD countries. Countries have launched emergency measures either income benefits or uh, wage subsidies. Uh, they've introduced them quickly to keep families afloat, but as these emergency measures wind down, can countries build back better? Today's session will be moderated by Mark Stabile. Mark is the stone-chaired professor of wealth inequality and professor of economics at ANSIAD in Paris. He also directs the James M. and Kathleen D. Stone Center for the Study of Wealth Inequality at SCN. Now Mark's full bio is available in the conference materials on the website, and so I won't list his many, many achievements, but I would like to highlight how lucky we are. Mark is our moderator today. He's remarkably well placed to moderate this session. Mark is Canadian and he knows Canadian issues well. Indeed, from 2007 to 2015, he was the founding director of the School of Public Policy and Governance at the University of Toronto and Professor of Economics and Public Policy at the Rotman School of Management at the University of Toronto. But in his current position in Paris, he's well positioned to examine the policy choices made by Western nations generally <clears throat> and to compare the Canadian and international context. So we are in great hands with Mark as our moderator. Please welcome Mark Stabile, who will introduce our speakers. Well, thank you very much, uh, Keith, for that uh, very generous introduction. It's a pleasure to be with you uh, here from France. And um, as Keith said, tonight's session or today's session, if you're not in France, uh, will be on rethinking income protection. And of course, for those of you who have been to previous summer institutes, or if you follow social policy debates somewhere else by chance, you know this is uh, an issue of extensive policy discussion. We've talked about child benefits, basic income, social assistance reform, EI, workers benefits. These are just some of the programs 
that contribute to income protection and uh, income assistance. And they all, uh, in a sense, form part of the debate we're having today. And as Keith said, uh, COVID-19 has provided us with some additional information to consider in rethinking income protection. Are our policies as they exist now resilient, agile and fair enough to deal with the realities of income protection today? Uh, so I think that given all of this, the timing for this session could not be better. And frankly, our guest panelists for today are pretty amazing too. And I'll introduce them to you very briefly in a few minutes. Uh, but as Keith said, the full bios are available online. I have a couple of jobs, uh, but my main job is to encourage a lively discussion on these issues and to keep us on time. Uh, we have a lot to cover. Before I quickly introduce the panelists, let me just go over a very few housekeeping items. So after the presentations, we will have time to take some questions and have the panelists answer those questions. Uh, the way to ask a question in this case is to use the webinar's Q&A feature and to type your question in at any time. Uh, the features at the bottom of the Zoom screen. And uh, there are a lot of you, so we may not be able to get to all the questions, but that's the best way to do it. Uh, so we are going to hear from our presenters first, and then we'll open up to, to those questions. Let me begin by introducing the speakers then in the order that they will appear and just say one thing about them. So first will be Professor Hilary Hoynes, who's the Haas Distinguished Chair in Economic Disparities at the University of California, Berkeley. Uh, she recently served on the National Academy of Sciences Committee on building an agenda to reduce the number of children in poverty by half in 10 years. Professor David Green is at the Vancouver School of Economics at the University of British Columbia and is the chair of the expert committee to study the potential for using a basic income to reduce poverty and to prepare uh, for the emerging economy in BC. And Professor Miles Korak is at the Stone Center on Socioeconomic Inequality at the City University of New York. Uh, we share a benefactor among many other things, as you might have noticed in the name, and was a recent economist in residence uh, at Employment and Social Development Canada and continues to serve as an advisor to the deputy minister there. So not only do we have three outstanding academics uh, on this panel, but all three are really engaged with uh, social policy on the ground, uh, advising, uh, working with government, et cetera. And so we are uh, very lucky, and I'm now going to uh, turn to them. And so welcome, Hillary, you are up first, and I will let you know when your time is up. Uh, over to you. Thank you very much. Delighted to be here. Uh, welcome you from my home here in Berkeley, California. And my role in this panel is to bring in the perspective of social policy and income support programs uh, in the United States. Um, and in particular, I wanna cover sort of three things uh, in the time that I have with you today. I wanna start by describing uh, the sort of landscape of income support programs in the United States in the wake of entering the COVID-19 crisis then talk about the uh, sort of uh, economic relief package and response that the U.S. has taken in the crisis, and then end very briefly by speculating a little bit about uh, the potential long-run implications uh, of the current crisis from the perspective of children and uh, connecting to the research uh, that is new and growing, uh, showing the long run effects of uh, economic resources on, on children uh, as adults. So let me start by uh, just giving you a very uh, brief overview of the social safety net in the United States that is uh, aimed at low income families. And in particular, I know this is an ongoing issue that I hope we'll be able to talk about uh, in the course of this panel, uh, and that is the growing role of conditionality um, in the social safety net. So to start with just a basic primer, if you don't know much about the US social safety net, there's maybe four features that I wanna emphasize. Uh, the first is it is not universal. Uh, our benefits tend to be targeted on three groups, uh, the elderly, the disabled, and families with children. So notably, that leaves out essentially prime-aged adults without children, prime-aged uh, able-bodied adults without children. Additionally, it's a very patchwork system in the United States with respect to immigrants, and particularly undocumented immigrants uh, are really left out. Number two, very little, a very small share of our benefits are provided in cash. 
Uh, we tend to lean into a heavy use of tax credits, which I know is also the case in Canada, uh, with a heavy reliance on food and nutrition programs as kind of a big source of what I think of as near cash assistance. Thirdly, uh, there is a heavy and growing use of conditionality in the United States. And in particular, what I mean by conditionality is increasingly uh, excluding the elderly and the disabled, so benefits targeted to families with children and the limited benefits for prime age adults uh, able-bodied without children, there's increasing conditionality on work. So in other words, we tend to provide many more benefits that are topping up earnings, particularly low earnings, rather than providing a safety net out of work, which is very relevant, of course, in the current context. Finally, our funding levels are not very high compared to uh, comparison uh, countries. So let me just uh, give you a little bit more insight into that. This pie chart gives you um, a, uh, a, a, a summary of the key programs in the United States uh, for low-income uh, individuals. Uh, and just starting from the sort of uh, 12 o'clock uh, part of the uh, orientation of the graph, the orange, darker orange uh, slices are these food and nutrition programs. So SNAP or food stamps is very key. In a way, the most universal of our uh, low income programs provides uh, benefits to uh, purchase grocery, uh, goods at the grocery store. Uh, additional food and nutrition programs. The refundable tax credits you can see are a large share of benefits, even larger share if you condition on a non-elderly, non-disabled. Moving to the blue areas of uh, supplemental security income is cash benefits, but for poor elderly and disabled uh, households. So a different kind of uh, targeting there. And then the lighter blue give us some other in-kind kinds of benefits, housing, training, uh, et cetera. And 9% is basically uh, the closer to cash assistance, which is very minimal. Uh, and so that gives you a sort of large perspective on assistance um, in the United States. Our graph gives a similar perspective, but focusing on families with children. And it sort of nicely organizes the spending in category. So you can really see here, particularly for um, uh, families with children, the heavy reliance on tax credits um, and uh, food and nutrition programs. And uh, here I'm not going to be talking about health, but that's the health program for low income families with children. Another way to think about the social safety net, and again, continuing to talk about families with children, is not how much do we spend on these programs, but to what extent are they poverty. And you can see here that um, off a 2015 baseline, this is from this National Academy of Sciences panel that Mark mentioned that I was part of, uh, at baseline, about 13% of children are poor in this, uh, for this um, baseline year in 2015. And then the uh, red bars down below are simulations of how much the poverty weight rate would increase if we eliminated uh, certain income support uh, or social safety net programs. And you can see that the tax credits, the earned income tax credit and the CTC is our child tax credit, uh, are the largest anti-poverty levers in the United States for children. Secondly comes the food stamps or uh, a SNAP program, the food assistance programs. And the, our basic cash assistance program through TANF is so small that it's bundled uh, with many other um, benefits. So cash assistance plays a much smaller role uh, today in the United States, and I'll come back to that. So this growing conditionality uh, comes from uh, two sources. The earlier source is the rise of, well, uh, of um, in-work benefits through both welfare reform and adding work conditionality to our cash transfer program. And uh, importantly, the rise of in-work credits through the earned income tax credit and then subsequently the child tax credit in the United States. 
subsequent to that sort of movement back in the 1990s has been ongoing, uh, particularly under the current administration, trying to add more work requirements to other components of the social safety net, notably our food assistance program, as well as public health insurance. And this is still in a kind of piloting stage across many states. Um, uh, and there's a great interest among some parts of the policy community in the United States to further expand work requirements. So with that sort of background, we have a social safety net in the United States that is very focused on incentivizing work and topping up low wages. In its best manifestation, that might work okay in a time of uh, availability of work. Um, we could even debate at how adequately it works in that setting. But it certainly is very ill-equipped to help out in a time of little work, such as we are experiencing today. And in fact, if you look at evidence from the Great Recession, we see that there is a greater vulnerability and volatility of low incomes during the Great Recession. And you can really kind of tie a direct line between this growing work conditionality of the social safety net and a, a greater impacts on low income families in the Great Recession. It's too early to see all that playing out completely in the current crisis, uh, but that's what I wanna turn to today. So let me show you one final graph before turning to the crisis today. And that is, if you again continue to look at benefits targeted at children in the United States, the sum total of all these changes are that we're providing much more assistance. We're, we're targeting a lot more of our assistance to working families than non-working families. So the graph here on the left shows that through this period of welfare reform and the rise of the earned income tax credit, we have this growing amount of resources that are, that are going to working families and a declining amount, you know, a kind of mirrored declining amount uh, to families uh, without earnings. And what that also implies is that our assistance to um, lower income levels is declining as a share of the total. So for example, the share of total spending on children that is going to families with income below 50, between 50 and 100% of the federal poverty line has declined substantially. And a lot of the growth of our social safety net, particularly through the child tax credit and the earned income tax credit is going to slight, it's, I think of it as the more advantaged of the disadvantaged population. So we're moving our uh, 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 expenditures up the distribution of ways in this process of adding conditionality. Okay, so let me tell you what uh, the response to the COVID crisis, the emergency response to the COVID crisis uh, has been. And I wanna focus very quickly on four components which represent the direct payments to households. First and centrally, uh, the expansion of our unemployment ins insurance system, which is administered at the state level in the United States with tremendous variation and very low benefits in some states and you know, sort of um, uh, higher benefits in, in others. Uh, the federal policy included a $600 flat top up to all unemployment insurance recipients as well as expanding eligibility to previously uncovered groups like self-employed gig economy workers and those with sufficiently low earnings to be eligible under the traditional unemployment insurance. That's been critical. We also had a one-time only emergency impact payment, uh, similar in structure though not magnitude to your CERB in Canada, that provides $1,200 per adult and $500 per child and is phased out uh, at the income levels that you see on the screen. We had an expansion to food stamp benefits, uh, not across the board, but for those that were uh, receiving less than the maximum benefit, they were lifted up to the maximum amount. And then finally, something that is particular in the US context is about 30 million children receive uh, free and reduced price lunch and breakfast at schools in the United States. It's an enormous amount of children. And when schools closed, they lost access to an enormous amount of 
uh, food and nutrition programs. And so we have been in the process of converting those benefits to uh, an EBT card uh, for households to receive in the absence of their children being at school. The spending on this has added up to about $600 billion through the end of July. The vast majority uh, in, the, in the unemployment insurance and the economic relief payments. These SNAP and uh, PEBT expansions are so small you can barely see them here, relative. So it's not a particularly targeted uh, benefit in the income space. So despite this uh, quite dramatic and robust uh, um, response, we see in the United States a great amount of economic distress. So uh, there are two uh, nationally representative surveys in the field right now, pop-up surveys in the field, a census pulse survey and the COVID impact survey. Both of them are measuring food insecurity, uh, which is a measure that is uh, meant to assess whether households have enough money for, for adequate food consumption. And here is the uh, actual survey question here on the left in italics. Over the past 30 days, uh, it was sometimes or often the case that, quote, their food just didn't last and, quote, they didn't have enough money to get more. And you can see that, that I've got this historical comparison measure uh, from the National Health Interview Survey in the United States. And you can see that this um, food insecurity measure has practically tripled for respondents with children and more than doubled uh, for households overall. And this is uh, along with dramatic use of um, food banks in the United States is really showing a, a food crisis um, uh, that's very widespread. And so in some work that I've been doing uh, that is forthcoming in a, excuse me, in a, a Brookings volume, we investigated why it is that we can simultaneously see so much need despite this expansion uh, that was quite robust uh, on the part of Congress and the administration. And we, uh, I'll just kind of very uh, quickly mention this uh, and perhaps we can come back to it if there's some uh, opportunities for uh, compare and contrast between Canada and the United States. We concluded there are three factors that are explaining uh, this increased economic need. Uh, and the first is timing. So there, the states were burdened with dramatic increases in demand. Many state data and administrative infrastructures are simply not ready for the job. This led to weeks and weeks of delays of getting payments out. And this is particularly a problem when you're starting up new programs, like adding the $600 flat unemployment insurance supplement, or uh, having to expand uh, unemployment to cover groups that hadn't been covered before. These take a long time, and the state federalist system in the United States means that you're duplicating those efforts across all the states. Stump states are, are responding fairly quickly, others not. Number two, the magnitude of the benefits are relatively modest outside of unemployment. So if that is not coming into your household, you're in big trouble. Which leads me to the third point, which is our social safety net has some very important holes in it, both in terms of statutory eligibility. For example, uh, undocumented workers are not eligible for most of these benefits. And additionally, administrative hurdles, lack of automation in uh, providing benefits, which I know is something that is coming up in the Canadian context as well, pushing through these relief payments through the tax system, when we've got 12 million individuals in the United States who are eligible, but hadn't prior, hadn't uh, filed taxes, and therefore not part of the automated system. All of this sort of adds together to uh, providing some insights into why uh, we're seeing so much economic distress. And this is even before uh, I should point out that the unemployment $600 top up has now expired in the United States as of July 31st. We have yet to have updated data. We'll have it next week on this new uh, updated measure of food insecurity um, after the $600 provision has expired. So let me just end with a, a few minutes talking about the potential implications for the long run. 
So we have this sort of growing uh, body of evidence that is rarely, fairly recent that shows that providing more resources through the social safety net and other sorts of income uh, supplements not only reduces poverty today, uh, but there's robust evidence uh, that increases in resources lead to improvements in uh, um, education outcomes, earnings, um, and health in adulthood. And so let me just leave you with this sort of kind of summary. We've got evidence from the earned income tax credit, from food stamps, from early 20th century um, uh, um, uh, cash welfare programs, uh, tribal UBI-like payments, and a consistent body of evidence that these programs not only uh, improve outcomes in the short run, food insecurity and child health and infant health, but we, we are now also able to document that this improves outcomes in the long run. So I leave you with this because it's an important context for thinking about the broad sort of cost benefit analysis of these income support programs and the potential scarring effects of this COVID crisis and its impact on, um, on family resources uh, that may result in the longer term. So thanks very much and I look forward to the conversation. Thank you very much, Hillary. And while we're waiting uh, for David to uh, turn himself on and get the screen set up, let me just note that uh, that slide with timing, magnitude, and incomplete or completeness, uh, we will definitely have an opportunity to come back to that. I'm sure the other panelists had noted some of the issues that, that are also happening in Canada and elsewhere. Um, while we always had take up problems and eligibility problems, you know, are people actually getting the benefits they're eligible for and how do we get the right people eligible? I mean, COVID really did highlight as people thought about how do I actually apply? Can I apply? This really, this really came to the forefront. And so I wanna come back to that after we hear from all of the panelists. And with that, let me, uh, let me turn it over to David. Great, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Thanks a lot, Mark. Um, and everybody else, thanks for including me in this. This is obviously, as everybody has said so far, an incredibly important uh, moment in history to be thinking about uh, public policy. And one of the ones, uh, one of the policies that's really come to the fore, as everybody knows, is, is basic income. In Canada, that's been highlighted by the letter from the 50 senators pushing for the idea of uh, uh, pushing for the idea of, of converting the CERB into a permanent basic income. Um, as uh, Mark said, I'm uh, part of a panel uh, that consists of uh, me, Lindsay Teds at the University of Calgary, and uh, Reese Kesselman at SFU. And we were given a mandate by the BC government to consider whether a basic income uh, should be, become the main pillar of the transfer policy in BC. Our mandate is actually broader than that. The idea is uh, if, if not a basic income, then what other reforms would one do that would bring in the sort of principles of a basic income? Uh, once, once you look at the basic income, you see uh, a lot of um, claims, a uh, very wide range of claims about what a basic income could do, ranging from improving health all the way over to in, increasing entrepreneurship we were well resourced, we've been well resourced, and we have uh, commissioned over 40 research projects from uh, mo pretty much all Canadian researchers, but some scattered around the, the globe. Mark, uh, in fact, has written two papers for us on all of these, these sort of claims about a basic income, plus also uh, elements of the current system so that we can put things in context and know where the gaps are. We, we put in our first report uh, in, just a month ago. Um, the final report's due in December. Uh, in fact, though, uh, we, we have actually great uh, publication rights, so we'll be able to put everything out. All of these studies will be out in the public domain, uh, but the, uh, uh, the government, quite reasonably, has first rights of, of sort of putting things out into the public. So we're not at the moment allowed to, uh, or not in a position to uh, present our recommendations and conclusions right now. What I'm gonna do instead is talk a bit about what we've learned um, as a way of sort of deepening the debate uh, and, and a way that we think of as sort of uh, thinking about how to take basic income seriously because often it's talked about in, in sort of very simple terms. In fact, that's one of the claims about a basic income that, it, that it, what it brings to the table is, 
power and its simplicity. We simply write everybody a check. But once you get closer, you, you start to see that there is considerable complexity in the, in the policy. And part of what I want to do is sort of put some of that complexity on the table as a basis for further discussion. Um, uh, so let me just say there's one of the things that is absolutely not universal about a universal basic income is the definition of a basic income. Everybody seems to have a different one. Um, these are three elements that are common, though, uh, as I said, not, not completely universal across definitions of basic income. So one is it that it's universal. That means either that we're cutting a check for everybody in, in society or, or all adults, or that everyone has a guarantee in the negative income tax version of it. Um, second, it's unconditional. This is interestingly sort of pretty much the opposite of what he was talking about for the current US system. That means unconditional on uh, things like work in particular, possibly on age. Um, it's also permanent, that is, you can rely on it in the long run so that you can make life choices on it. And oftentimes, it's also based at the individual level rather than the family level. Um, our, our framework we set out was we needed a broader way to try to think about uh, how, to, how to judge what a basic income was doing. And we, uh, the, the way we framed it was in terms of whether it would move BC towards being a more just society. We didn't want to choose a particular notion of, of justice, uh, but virtually all liberal theories of justice uh, have at their core a, a central focus on self-respect and social respect. So these quotes here, the first one is from Martha Nussbaum, people should be treated as dignified beings whose worth is equal to that of others. This is, that, this is sort of the framework that we used for, uh, for considering it. And part of the report is to take that down into things that are more into uh, more practical attributes. Uh, so let, let me now kind of go through a set of questions that have come up for us um, that, that I think help in some ways to, to frame the debate and frame the discussion. The first is uh, once we go past this sort of broader goal, the, there's uh, often a set of uh, objectives that are that are put out, not not only one by any one uh, proponent, often a few in combination. Uh, but but these are the three most common from from our uh, our studies. The first is to reduce poverty, uh, so a, a sort of standard transfer policy kind of target. The second is reforming the economy, changing the nature of work and uh, how we interact with the labor market. And there a big claim is often that this is necessary because technological change and artificial intelligence in particular is going to essentially wipe out jobs or else render them all precarious. Uh, and you saw some, Jerome Ace Moglu talked a little bit about that the other day, I'm gonna come back to that in a second. The third is the unconditionality part, simplifying the way that we do the transfers for whatever reason we wanna make them make it so that they are less sort of Kafkaesque, more respectful of the people in receipt. There is a fourth one, which is sometimes put forward, uh, which is uh, often associated with Milton Friedman, an idea that these policies could actually, you know, sort of reduce or eliminate government. That's not actually really a major part of any of the proposals that I've seen that have been put forward in Canada. So I'm not really gonna talk about that. Um, let me actually go for one moment. I want to talk about this second option, this, this second objective, which is to reform the labor market in the, in the face of uh, perceived huge changes in the, in the labor market. Um, Daron talked about technology as something that is endogenous, that is something that we can actually shape with policy. As, and that's very different from the spirit of what I just put forward as the, as the objective a moment ago which treats the technology as sort of a, a force from heaven, something exogenous, something that we just have to respond to. And I think Daron's framing of, of our ability to actually control this environment is correct. But I also think there's another issue uh, for Canada that is quite different from the US. Uh, Daron talked a lot about, say, declining labor share and other uh, problems in the labor market. If you look at Canadian data, you don't see the same trends, not at least in the last 15 to 20 years. So this figure, for example, shows the proportion of workers who are permanent, that is, they're not contract, they're not seasonal, and they're, and they're full-time, and they're employees, they're not self-employed. And, and what you'll notice here is for both men and women, for the last 20 years, that proportion has been pretty rock solid. In other words, we are not seeing evidence of a big run-up because of the gig economy, say, in the last few years. 
what we do see, if you go back far enough, is that there's a decline in the proportion of these quote unquote good jobs relative to say the 1980s. These first two points come from work by Leah Vosco at, at U of T and she talks about persistent precarity, which I think is probably the right way to think about it. The key point here is that if a, UBI, a basic income is meant to be a good tool because we are concerned that we're not gonna be able to distribute the output of the economy through work, either directly through work or through work-related transfers, there's not a lot of evidence that that's, that, that, that that's a reason to do this. There is, uh, ongoing precarity, there is a declining unionization, there is increases, as far as we can tell, in sort of fissured work, that is the tendency for, say, janitors at, a, at an engineering firm to work for a contract uh, firm and have lower wages and, and worse working conditions as a result. Those things are happening. The question is, is a basic income the right response for those things, which have been persistent and longstanding in the economy? Um, my, my feeling is that a lot of that is not the the basic income is a very indirect way to getting at that, allowing people potentially to walk away from bad jobs as opposed to working directly on regulation and worker bargaining power. Uh, let me leave that one. Second question, how will it be financed? This is often something that is put as uh, something to be treated separately from the design of the, of the program in the first place. So people will talk about a basic income, why it's good, what it will do, and then they'll say, and somehow or another, we're, gonna, we're going to finance it. And maybe sometimes they give you ideas, but the two are not tied together. And we would argue that in fact, the two are very, very tightly tied together, that anybody who gives you a basic income proposal should be telling you exactly how they're gonna, they're gonna fund it at the same time. And that's, that's for two reasons. The first is, if we're going to fund it through the personal income tax system, we're going to affect incentives, including incentives to file taxes, higher up the income distribution. So we often focus on questions like the welfare wall and tax back rates at the low end of the, of the, wage, of the income distribution, but we're going to have substantial impacts on, uh, on after tax, sorry, marginal effective tax rates at higher levels at the same time. The second is often proponents argue that there are going to be savings other places in the system, that we're going to replace other systems or we're going to have reductions in things like health care and criminal justice spending. Uh, and so in that case, obviously the two are, are very tightly tied together. I think it's worth taking a moment to take a look at what budgets actually look like to, to think about the extent to which that latter avenue is really available. This is the BC budget, the last BC budget before COVID. Uh, so <laughs> look quite different at the moment. Um, and this is proportion of spending in the various categories. And you can see sort of education is huge. Um, and that's not one that you would really expect to be reduced by a basic income, I don't think. Debt service, uh, natural resource spending, those ones, again, probably not affected. The ones where there might be an effect are you could replace the income assistance system, although in some sense that's sort of relabeling what's already there rather than real savings. Uh, there's sometimes claims that we would reduce health spending. Uh, so uh, Ellen Forger, for example, uh, argues that you could reduce hospital, that in the income experiment, hospital visits went down by 8%. Um, I, I think there's reasons to question that evidence. But I, I, to my take, our take going through this, and we've gone through this pretty carefully, you can maybe get 10% savings out of, out of converting to a basic income, maybe. Um, and so to put in perspective what that would mean, here is the total BC budget in 2019-2020 was $58 billion. If you introduced a, introduced a demogrant where you paid everybody in the economy $18,000, so enough to get them right to the poverty line, uh, that would basically double the BC budget. If you went for a, nat, uh, a negative income tax version with a 30% tax back rate, you need to increase the budget by about 40%. So a 10% uh, increase in uh, or 10% savings possibly that you could find in the system are, is not going to actually get you very far. Um, it, could, it could fund a lower uh, negative income tax rate, but remember that you would then be replacing the, the income assistance system with that, and, and including the disability part of the system. This is the, this is the federal budget, and here the issue I think is even harder to, it's even harder to find where the savings are going to come to. Uh, you could find savings again in the health transfer, although that would mean the provinces don't get it. The big place you could, you could have changes potentially is the employment insurance component. If you replaced EI 
with, with a, a basic income. There, I think the issues become questions about how we think about insurance. If, if we're doing this as a demigrant and we send people a check and we've eliminated the employment insurance system, what we're telling people is you need to self-insure. Yes, you just lost your job. We already sent you the check. And I think that's an important component of trying to think this, think this through. Uh, three, and this, this is very tightly related with the last point, and this is a place where we've put a lot of our emphasis, uh, which is a question of how does it integrate with other systems? The idea that a basic income system is going to simply replace everything else is really a non-starter and most proponents recognize that. Uh, it, so, for example, payments to the disabled, the vulnerable, drug addicted population, youth aging out of care. One can imagine that a basic income is helpful for all of these groups, but also that they need full supports, that just giving money, for example, to the vulnerable drug addicted population without other supports around them is going to be problematic. Um, and so we've actually started thinking about this less as sort of the party game. If I was stuck on a desert island, which one policy would I choose, but rather how would we build a support uh, structure on which a basic income could be, could be added? Um, and, and that I think is that I think is the is the sort of the key question. Where else do we need to make adjustments if if we're going to really effectively use this policy? The third is something that Hillary already brought up um, in work that we've done with census and tax and death records, so that we actually get a census. Uh, we found that about seven percent of people have tax forms, but not but don't file taxes in a year, and more troublingly, another three percent are not present in the tax records at all. Um, those are numbers that then add up to something that's similar to what Jen Robson and Saul Schwartz have found uh, using other data. Essentially, there's a real question about some people falling through the gaps if we try to deliver this through the tax system. There's also uh, important questions about responsiveness. Um, uh, let me, th 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 I'm going to do this one and, and one more and then and finish off. This, I think, is a really big point, which is we have a tendency to talk about these policies in terms of what they do to the budget constraint, for example, what they're going to do to incentives. Uh, but something as big as basic income, replacing a bunch of our other systems with a basic income, fundamentally affects the way our society runs and how we think about what is fair and, and just in our society. And so that brings down to, to talking about, okay, so what is inherent in a basic income? There's, uh, as many people know, Van Peris uh, has, has written extensively on this. He talks about, and so do many of the other people who have a consistent uh, outlook on this, talk about this as uh, trying to maximize real freedom, uh, where real freedom is defined as the means people require for the pursuit of their conception of the good life. In other words, what we're going to do is give you the means to pursue what you think is good with no strings attached. Whatever you decide is fine, as long as obviously it doesn't harm other people. Um, it's a, it's a quite a consistent framework. It, it talks about the rents in society that come from land and resources and the notion that we all in some sense have an equal, uh, an equal right to those rents since they, as by definition as economic rents, uh, are not about returns to effort or, or productive behavior. Um, and I think that's a very consistent and good way to think about it. I think the key you have to keep focused on here is this is very much a focus on individualism it's very much focused on uh, individual choice and liberty. Liberty is given the prime, prime place at the table here, and that's why it's a cash payment. Um, in, in, uh, lost it. There we go. In uh, contrast, uh, Elizabeth Anderson, who's a, a, a philosopher at Michigan, University of Michigan, <laughs> takes this on saying, uh, no, we have to think about uh, uh, liberty in a somewhat different way. She basically says, look, this real liberty essentially favors distributing income over direct income provision of particular goods. The preference, this is I'm reading now, the preference for income rather than income transfers reflects the commitment of real libertarianism to promoting freedom conceived as a generic good. The real libertarian urges that we provide people with the resources they need to achieve their aims whatever those aims are. They give no special priority to freedom from disease over freedom to idle. Why is this not working? Oh, there we go. Um, what we really owe each other is something more. We owe each other the means to non-oppression. And, and so her take on this is really that uh, we need to be thinking about what our goals are 
in something that looks uh, broader than simply uh, liberty in its own right. Um, again, it's not working. Oh, here we go. Um, and, and I, I think the other way to think about that is whether we want to try to design policies that give focus to uh, that give focus to building community as opposed to simply putting resources in people's hands and hoping that they will build community themselves. And that's my my time up. I'm almost I'm almost done, Mark. Um, let, let me let me finish by one one final one final point, which is uh, CERB is not a basic income. Okay, CERB, when we saw what was defined as a basic income earlier, CERB is conditional. It's conditional on earnings last year, on losing a job due to COVID and not quitting a job. There is no discussion of financing, even though I described that as an important component of, of any serious proposal of a basic income. It's ad, ad hoc, it's integration with other programs is very ad hoc. It's essentially a one-term emergency payment. It's very good for that, but it, the, the claims that CERB is telling us that a basic income is anything good or bad, I think are completely uh, misleading. I think we need to take CERB off the table as part of this discussion, except for maybe some parts about delivery, but it's not telling us how a basic income would work in the long run. And I think framing the discussion that way is misleading. So just to conclude, basic income is not a simple policy. You need to understand a whole set of questions. What is the objective you're after? How it'll be financed? And most importantly, how it'll affect interact with other systems. That is how we, we, we would need to, de to devise the rest of the system around it. Um, making a basic income the centerpiece of policy implies choosing a particular form for society with heavy emphasis on liberty as the, as the prime mover, uh, as the prime virtue. And finally, CERB is, is really not a basic income and we need to make sure the debate is clear on that. Thank you very much, David. Uh, that was great. And let me just, uh, as we're beginning the transition to Miles, note that a couple of things that I think it would be helpful to come back to. The first is that, that most countries tried to think through and balance, do we, do we go for protecting jobs or do we go for getting cash to people? Of course, countries can do both, but that was a debate that many places had. And, and I think we want to think about uh, a basic income in that context. What would have been the scenario had a basic income been in place, I think, is what some people are trying to get at uh, when they talk about, uh, can we turn the CERB into something? Although your point was well taken, of course. Uh, uh, to the audience, the 300 plus of you out there, one of the nice things about a Zoom webinar is you can ask your question now. Uh, I won't actually ask it now, but you don't have to wait. Uh, you can start writing them in and collect them so that we can get right to the questions when we have time. So feel free. Now, as we turn to uh, Miles, let me just correct. Uh, if I misspoke, I apologize. Uh, I meant to have said that uh, Miles is not currently an advisor to ESDC. He was in the past. He's not currently advising them or the deputy minister um, at the present time. And uh, if so, I just wanted to get that clear. And now, Miles, uh, we can turn it over to you. Um, it's called social policy now. And um, I want to make some rather concrete uh, recommendations for the next steps in social policy. Um, and I'm riffing off, uh, riffing off a, a number of uh, conversations, uh, including um, the organizers of this conference and Mark and David included, um, but also a careful reading of just the very dynamic uh, literature and outpouring of concern amongst Canadians um, uh, in the last four or five um, months. Uh, let's see if I can get this started. Um, and obviously David just mentioned CERB. Uh, it's probably the uh, most extensive and quickest change to Canadian public policy in, in, in living um, memory. And the, um, the immediate conversation, uh, almost immediate, was what's next? Um, both in the short term, uh, but also in the longer term for the design of social policy. And that's sort of my motivating question. What's next for social policy in light of the lessons learned? And maybe I can introduce this by referring to the three different meanings of the word now in the title of my presentation. Now is the reform. Time to meet citizens where they are right now and building on what we have now. Um, the timing of reform um, is certainly clear to many people. Uh, there's 
probably an austerity agenda out there, but there's also a major social reform agenda. Now is the time to start uh, thinking about this. And David, David made reference to the um, letter signed by 50 senators who spoke very much about the urgency of reform. But it also spoke about the nature of reform. Uh, the importance, and just as Hillary suggested with the United States, the importance of having real time delivery of meeting citizens where they are right now. And, all, and what goes with, along with that is appreciating that government can't fully understand the needs of, of all Canadians in all parts of their lives in all places in the country. Um, and finally, perhaps what's a little bit unique to my presentation is building upon uh, what we have now. And let me just amplify uh, that. I can't resist giving you this quote from uh, William Beveridge's uh, report to the British government uh, during uh, World War II. And uh, Beveridge's uh, report set the foundation for the uh, welfare state as we know it in sort of the, uh, the Anglo world. And um, Leonard Marsh, who is the architect of Canada's post-war uh, social welfare system, was a student of Beveridge. And, and, and Beveridge sort of speaks, uh, well, he says, when we are abolishing landmarks of every kind, now is the opportunity <laughs> for revolutionary thinking. Uh, a revolutionary moment is, is a time for revolutions, not for patching. And I'm in both, uh, I guess, agreement and, and, and uh, in disaccord uh, with this view. Uh, we certainly need to go boldly forward, but not necessarily to where we have not been before. And I guess what I mean by that is that the welfare state now is much richer, more developed than anything that uh, Marsh or Beveridge had to deal with. So we have plenty of precedents. We have also many um, uh, uh, lessons that we've learned from the past to move forward incrementally. And I don't necessarily mean incrementally in small step. We can think steps. We can think of radical incre incrementalism involving both significant and demonstrably feasible reforms. So taking a step from where we are, working from what we know has worked uh, and moving forward. And um, I sort of learned this from uh, Sherry Torgerman and Ken Battle, the, the importance of this sort of steady incrementalism towards a desirable goal. And so if we have that way of proceeding, how would we suggest um, uh, um, Canadian social policy should evolve in the post-COVID era? I'm going to suggest uh, three, three types of reforms. First, we should maximize auto-enrollment and just-in-time program delivery. So this is a story about how the public service functions and how the program delivery side of the public service functions. Secondly, we should offer full income support with engagement. And this relates to the discussions we've just heard about uh, uh, basic uh, uh, income. And finally, we need better in, uh, income and earnings insurance. And we should do it giving people agency. Um, the fourth of my three recommendations is to echo some of the concerns that uh, Darren Asamugulu uh, rose uh, uh, last week uh, on market shaping policies. Um, social policy has to work in concert with a more inclusive uh, labor market. Uh, we can only paddle uh, upstream so far through tax and transfer programs and public policy should be more engaged in shaping the market so that it produces more inclusive, uh, more secure uh, jobs and earnings. So that's where I'm gonna go in about the next 10 minutes or, or so. Let me speak first about program uh, uh, delivery. And I think the first thing we should recognize um, is the appreciation um, that we owe a very professional public service in Canada. Uh, the last four or five months have in no small measure been an exercise in which the program delivery side of governments have been forming the uh, policy side, uh, reversing sort of uh, uh, decades 
of, 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 of the way we've been pr proceeding. So we can't ignore the program delivery side in a major way. We should be very uh, appreciative of all the efforts and the professional public service we have, but there's more to do. And, um, uh, oops, I think I'm going the wrong way here. Um, first, we've recognized the importance of the uh, tax system in delivering programs. I mean, going way back to the introduction of the GST, increasingly the tax system has been a vehicle for social policy. Um, but many authors have pointed out that tax falling rates are significantly below uh, 100% and particularly high for the very groups that we want to reach. Uh, I think the government learned this lesson when it expanded the uh, and introduced and expanded the uh, Canada Child Benefit. Uh, some of the groups that uh, were um, meant to receive this benefit, particularly in Indigenous populations, had very low tax filing rates. And the um, the response sort of put out more information, uh, try to encourage uh, people to file. But I think behavioral economics teaches us that poverty and low income and income security are points of a great deal of stress in people's lives. People have only so much cognitive bandwidth and we have to accept the fact that filing rates are never going to be uh, 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 perfect. So I want to echo some of the um, uh, recommendations made by Anna Cameron and her colleagues and Jennifer Robson and a number of her co-authors on just the need for the CRA to um, auto-complete income tax returns for the uh, low income uh, population. Uh, even when we do this, uh, obviously, real-time benefit receipt is going to remain a challenge, but the fact that certain groups in the population should have their uh, income tax forms completed automatically is one, I think, important step that the government might think seriously uh, about in terms of uh, the whole program delivery side. Um, that said, we should also recognize that money isn't everything important as it is, that certain groups will always need community advocates. And I think we should be strengthening in a major way the nonprofit sector and, and really driving home that we need active interventions and active wraparound supports for many populations. So auto-completing income tax returns is not the final uh, story in this, and there has to be people on the ground closer to the needs uh, and the dynamics of people who often fall uh, through the safety net, regardless of how tightly it is knit. Let me move to uh, income support with engagement. And this again is sort of my theme of now here. I think we can philosophically <laughs> and practically build upon what's already in place. Uh, in fact, in some measures, I, I take David's point about you know, basic income meaning a lot of things to a lot of different people, but I think the Basic Income Canada Network has sort of uh, fine-tuned uh, its, uh, fine -tuned its uh, uh, image of that. This very nice paper by Pasma and Sheila Regeer uh, which was released below uh, before the uh, pandemic, puts forward a very concrete proposal, uh, does talk about financing, does talk about tax reform, which I agree should be part of uh, this discussion, and uses models that we already have. We have a basic income for older Canadians. We have a basic income for uh, families with children. And as many have pointed out, including John Stapleton and others, that it's the sort of working age population, the singles um, um, that are falling uh, through the gaps. And um, this notion of a sort of a negative income tax type of uh, version for that population is also uh, something that I think is reasonably on the agenda. And um, 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 income support um, has been for that population, the work age population, has in fact been a mainstay of Canadian social policy. A great part of the, the employment insurance system is really a regionally based income support program governed by the variable entrance requirement and the working while on claim provisions. So we do this uh, now, let's think about doing it uh, better. And perhaps the way of taking that next step is to scale up the Canada workers benefit. 
And I give you the parameters that that program in this uh, picture from the last federal budget, which was some time ago now, admittedly. <laughs> uh, but this is the design of the program, and it, it basically echoes um, the employ employment income uh, tax credit in, in the United States. But if you're not making any money, you don't get any benefit. And so I, th I think the next step is to have a discussion about the unconditional part of a program like this uh, and what all of these parameters should be to target on the um, uh, low income working age uh, population. There are good papers uh, uh, um, uh, discussing this with different uh, rationale. Um, this paper by um, Coble and, and, and Pollard in the Canadian Public Policy uh, sort of puts that unconditional payment sort of um, it, it bases it on income assistance levels in the provinces. You could imagine the, the CERB being a precedent, but I do want to introduce a precedent we already have. In legislation, we have a poverty reduction strategy, <laughs> and it has particular indicators and measures of poverty. One of them is very much associated with, with dignity, the deep income poverty line. And that's three quarters of the official poverty line. So the other way of setting that uh, unconditional payment is going back to the legislation you've actually passed and the targets you've set and gearing the payment uh, to the poverty line and particularly the deep income of poverty uh, line. And the other nice thing about this is the uh, poverty line varies across 50 communities uh, in the country. So it will be sort of just like the, uh, the EI program is, if you will, in some ways. That would set a, 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 an unconditional payment of somewhere between uh, twelve and fifteen thousand uh, dollars. The other thing is where to set the plateau, and let me put on the agenda for discussion that that should be the official poverty line. Uh, we have a target that is going to reduce the uh, poverty rate by fifty percent uh, in the coming years. Well, if the government really took that seriously, then it should start reflecting that in uh, uh, the setting of this uh, uh, transfer program. So I'm going to argue, or I am arguing, that a modified Canada workers benefit is an income support that'll introduce the last fiber in a basic income network, uh, 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 basic income net that we already have in, 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 in Canada. Real-time delivery is still going to be a challenge, but from CERV, we, we learned the importance of this trust and verify uh, ethic that has appealed to Canadians and really made them feel that we are all in it together. So I would suggest that we allow individuals to self-select themselves into this program and that the Canada Re Revenue Agency reconcile any payments in the next tax year, rather than looking backward uh, through at last year's uh, tax uh, uh, returns for eligibility in this year's uh, payment. Let me um, move then to the whole discussion of insurance. And uh, here I want to give a different rationale to a Canada workers type of benefit, um, uh, but as insurance. Uh, the insurance function of employment insurance, I think uh, over the years since the major reform in 1971, has been compromised by other goals like regional income support, like so-called activation policy, and also because of complex in, uh, administration that constrains uh, individuals. And we've learned that the uh, program is not meeting Canadians where they are now. If you um, uh, look at the variable entrance requirement, it's based upon an unemployment rate in the region that you live uh, uh, on that, the three year moving average of that unemployment rate. So it's the past three months of unemployment that determines your eligibility now. When things happen quickly, when they happen suddenly, and when they happen with gravity, looking back three months is just not going to cut it anymore. All right. Um, so I'm going to suggest that, um, uh, that um, let me just skip over some of this, okay. I'm going to suggest that if we go back to the 1971 unemployment insurance legislation, there's a precedent um, there. We've did this before where um, there were five phases in that program. One was based upon the national unemployment rate and changes in the national unemployment rate. And it was a phase financed by the federal government through the progressive income tax system. 
we need a new phase of employment insurance that's federally financed and is sensitive to an indicator that moves when there are broad, sharp changes with, with the, um, uh, with the uh, uh, labor market. And I'm gonna suggest that that phase should focus not on jobs, on insuring jobs, but on insuring incomes. That's what CERB did. There was a, a, a $5,000 um, uh, um, um, condition. You had to have, you had to have earned $5,000 in the past. There was no how that money was earned. So we don't need to fall into the trap of whether the employment is insurable or not, or what is a job or not. Think about insuring income, not insuring jobs in this phase. And I would tie the eligibility to that, to the change in the provincial unemployment or employment rate. So what I'm imagining is a, a phase that shoots up and becomes much more generous when the employment rate changes uh, dramatically. And there are different ways of doing that. An indicator something like this was suggested to enhance the automatic stabilizer of, uh, of, uh, of um, um, cash payments in the United States. And we could assess uh, which indicator would be best for Canada, but I think it should be based upon the provincial unemployment rates because of the importance of very severe uh, regional shocks. Think what Alberta has gone through since oil prices fell. So the question is, uh, a type of Canada workers benefit now uh, as a new phase that's integrated with parameters are integrated with working while on claim, but when you need it, an unconditional payment uh, 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 pops uh, up. All right. Now there are other important steps to reforming uh, EI and I have a much longer version of this presentation that I've actually uh, posted on my website this morning so you can download all 70 odd slides uh, that talks about these other uh, aspects of the kind of reform uh, EI has to go through. But let me just conclude by briefly saying something on market uh, shaping policies. Also in the spirit of a, a feasible next step for the federal government that I hope would echo into uh, provincial government uh, uh, legislation. One of the things that we uh, learned um, uh, in this crisis was the importance of ethical uh, wage policies. Forward, I think governments have to really think hard about fairness and how wages embody that fairness for large segments of the uh, uh, population. It is going to be clear that in the aftermath of this pan pandemic, so-called essential workers, people referred to as heroes, aren't going to be paid anymore, and labor market inequality will, uh, will widen. Um, the federal government does have some power in setting the federal minimum wage for the federally re regulated uh, private uh, sector. And um, an easy first uh, next step is for the federal government to increase uh, that minimum wage. Right now, it's tied to provincial legislation. And in some measure, I'm asking uh, the government to resurrect uh, an expert panel report that was submitted just before the um, uh, the pandemic took hold. And they made specific recommendations on the uh, federal minimum wage. My view is, you know, minimum wages um, have a number of tiers to them. They're different for people, uh, for younger people, and they are different for people who are in tipped employment, for example. Um, but what we're seeing in a labor market is growing inequality that's based around, you know, firms that in some sense are superstars who that, are, that are winners. And if the federal government increase the minimum wage for the industries it regulated, it would be sending a signal to large firms. We should have basically a tier of the minimum wage for large firms where possibly uh, the rents are. are. Um, uh, and that might spill over into other sectors and it might encourage um, a provincial legislation. Miles, so I'll just remind you, we're a, few, we're a few mirrors over, yeah. Okay, so I'm going to just put up my summary slide for you, you to read and thank you for your uh, uh, patience. Thank uh, you very much, Miles. Uh, yes, no, that's great. And, um, and uh, some very interesting concrete, useful concrete policy proposals that will be excellent for us to pick up in our debate. So David and Hillary, can I ask you to unmute and to turn on your uh, video? And I wanna, I wanna start, so one of the um, places I wanna start, which I think draws on all three of your presentations is uh, as we think about what 
what an income protection uh, framework that is just and agile and resilient would look like. I mean, uh, Miles has put out some, some suggestions. Uh, Hillary has noted that in an area where actually coverage is better than for most people in the US, which is for families with children in particular, actually hunger and, uh, and hunger was strongest among those families. So where it, was, where it was quite strong, relatively speaking, we also have high levels of hunger. And David noted that you know, uh, a basic income is really self-insurance and, and you'd be asking people to self-insure already having the money and already built into their budget. So do you think, I guess what, what I would like to say is, do you think that we could actually have an income protection program that would have been able to respond fully to something like the COVID shock that we just saw? Would what Miles is proposing or what you guys are talking about actually allow for us to avoid one of, uh, one of the problems that governments obviously face in this context, which is they have to decide what to do and then they have to do it quickly. And, and during that time, people are suffering and it's hard to move the machinery of government quickly. Could the sets of proposals uh, that you guys have out there, would they have um, done the trick given the situation we just saw? Maybe, uh, maybe I'll let Hillary respond first if you want uh, and, then, and then go to David and Miles. Sure. Um... So I'm of the view that we would be much better prepared to respond to a crisis um, like we're experiencing now or the financial crisis of the late 1980s, uh, 90, uh, 2000s and so on, if we had systems in place that would automatically respond when we, when we have need. So I think particularly in the US context, um, with a very polarized political setting, getting Congress to agree to policies to respond to a crisis is very challenging. Um, and I would say that what resulted in the, in the COVID crisis is, is about as good as it could have been actually, in practically speaking, in terms of how quickly they responded and some dimensions of the response. So, you know, um, you know, I've got this book behind me, Recession Ready, which I've been uh, advertising in my Zoom background, which is a great um, kind of compendium of pieces that are trying to lay the groundwork for having more policies that are ready to respond to need. Um, so just to pick up on one other thing before passing it on, you had mentioned the fact, uh, notably, that the food insecurity rates have risen even more for families with children than for the population at large, which may seem at odds with the fact that I mentioned, which is true, that we've got more protection for families with children than for you know, individuals without children. But the challenge is twofold. One is yes, that's true, but, we, but the out of work assistance is poor, which, so that's not helping much. But number two, I think more importantly, is that the, the school closures created a very important additional layer of stress for families with children because the disadvantaged population in the United States gets, the children get a lot of their food and nutrition programs at school. And so that shut down and it took months for states to convert those you know, feeding programs at school to the cash out of them on debit cards, literally two to three months. So I think that it's a little bit hard to draw a lot of, um, there, there was very specific attributes of this crisis that I think created special problems for families. And I guess the last thing I would say, and there was a, a comment on this in the chat, is that you know this recession is like no other in terms of affecting women more than men. Um, and the, 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 both which jobs were shut down and that in combination with childcare responsibilities has created just special stresses uh, for families with children. So I guess I'll leave it at that. Okay, I do wanna come back to the effect on women in particular because there was a question about that. So, so don't lose that train. I'm gonna come back to that hopefully in a, in a minute. David, do you wanna? Um, I'm gonna be quick. I, the, Hillary's point about the, the political part is very interesting. It is, it is a, at the moment, more an American one than, than a Canadian one, but we have our moments when the political economy side is concerning as well. But I would, my conclusion is kind of the opposite. I actually, uh, I think that what we saw in this pandemic was something that was so big 
that whatever systems we already had in place, we would have needed to add on to in any case. So if we had a basic income, even of a negative income tax form, if you think of people who uh, have regularly sort of irregular work, they would already have built that backstop into their regular expenditure patterns, into everything that they're doing with their lives. Uh, then along comes something like COVID, wax them much harder. And as, as you just said, and somebody said on the chat, this is a much different recession than the other than the others that we've seen. Um, you know, to turn to them and say we've already built this system up, you're you're good to go. I think nobody would claim that that would be the right response. I think the right thing to do, and as far as I understand, Germany has this, is to essentially take what we've learned in this pandemic and build an emergency system and say, okay, at a certain point when when things and we can talk about what would trigger it. When, when you know unemployment goes high enough, when things get bad enough, we, we kick in, the CERB comes back in. We, we kick in this emergency system. Um, and, and to me, I worry about distorting the discussions about the ongoing needs, the long-term persistent needs that we have and need to uh, address in terms of reform, distorting them too much to be ready to essentially take on these big, uh, odd, you know, uh, white whale events. Um, yeah, so that's, I, I, I think I would rather try to compartmentalize them, say, yes, we need to have a resilient system for regular recessions. We need to have a se separate emergency system for this. And conflating the two, I think, has, the, has the, the possibility of distorting what we need to do in regular times. But the one where we fine-tuned already the parameters, so we know how it's going to work, we know how the implementation works, and so we've cut down the implementation time tremendously. That's yeah, so essentially we would have one, we would, we would have this bundle of policies, essentially take a bunch of people who were involved in all of the emergency responses that we've had now, put them in a room and don't let them out for like two weeks until they've codified everything they've learned and keep that on deck. Okay. I think just Miles? before going okay. to Miles, I think we're actually saying the same thing, but maybe the interpretation is a, is a bit different. I mean, I think I'm saying the same thing in the sense that we should have these policies ready to go and that automatically triggered of a crisis gets you down that road. I think that I wasn't taking a stand on whether they should just be part of the ordinary safety net. I mean, I didn't talk much about unemployment insurance. That's been critical, um, but that would that would be the main feature, I think, in uh, in a kind of emergency setting. So, Miles, yours kind of have that trigger, some of those triggers built in. I mean, is that uh, yeah. do you want to respond? Well, on rules versus uh, discretion, I think there'll always be a place for discretion. Uh, clearly, this um, uh, this crisis illustrates just how effective uh, our federal government has been uh, in a discretionary way. Uh, but it also, you know, whether there's going to be another big emergency like this down the road or not, it also just reveals the current inadequacies, ongoing things that we already uh, knew. Um, you think about the, as I mentioned, the uh, unemployment insurance system in Canada, it's automatization has been sort of uh, um, uh, uh, compromised by the way in which we use it as a regional income support policy in the first instance. So when Alberta got hit with this major shock, what, we, what could we do? Oh, well, let's sort of play around with the rules in a discretionary way, uh, reduce or eliminate the waiting uh, the, the waiting. Um, we could have uh, uh, had, uh, as I just suggested, a program that was uh, tied in an automatic way or some phase of it to the provincial unemployment rate, which is, uh, thanks to StatsCan, produced on a monthly basis. So um, there'll always be a role for discretion, um, but I think we could do a better, uh, much better in uh, the automatization rules in many of the programs. I want to I pick up on one of the questions asked uh, that, Miles, you touched on a little bit, but nevertheless, I want to highlight it because it's not COVID uh, related. And it reminds me of an article, uh, I think, I think Matthew, Matthew Desmond wrote it in the New York Times, although I'm not 100% sure about that. But it really, it talked about people who are actually full-time working. It's not a problem of whether they're in the workforce or not, but with that full-time work, they can't actually get out of poverty, right? And um, these people had this, this, and there's not a small number of them, unfortunately, you know, this was a pre-COVID problem. And 
the the way we're thinking about income support, which is make sure we improve insurance, make sure that we improve cash transfers if you lose their job. How do we think about that population, which you know, which are working forty hours, that have kids, and uh, they're still struggling to to even make the poverty line in um, terms of a fair income support system? Right. Like well, uh, you you know the programs as well as I do, and I think uh, the Canada Child Benefit has done a lot to lower child poverty uh, uh, in the country. And so I think mimicking that program, as I suggested, through the Canada Workers' Benefit for the working age population is really important. Um, I like the way you phrase that. I mean, I, someone else has said that too, you know, I mean, dignity is really compromised if someone working full year, full time at the minimum wage really can't have a secure and stable uh, life, um, including food security, including a right to appropriate uh, uh, housing, uh, never mind supporting uh, uh, their kids. And this is why I, I'm sort of um, hanging on to D Daron's talk. Um, you can do so much with taxes and transfers, but ultimately we have to think about the labor market is working in this area of increasing polarization. Um, I take David's point about permanent full-time workers sort of being flat in Canada, but it's interesting, it hasn't grown. So that means security is not on the upswing in Canada uh, either, in spite of what's going on in the United uh, uh, States. So having policy work in concert with aggressive uh, labor market shaping policies is really important, I think, Mark. But you should weigh in on this as well. I mean, you, you've thought as much about this as any of us. Let me give uh, let me give Hillary and David a chance, and then and then I'm happy to try to add. But yeah, Hillary, you want you want to add it all on this? Sure. I mean, I think I would mimic you know kind of echo some of the things that Miles mentioned in the U.S. context. I mean, I think what we do, what we you know, we have a system that does a good job of topping up low wages through our earned income tax credit. And, you know, like um, Miles stated, I think we have every reason to want to expand that so that more people have access to it. And it's primarily a, a, a policy that helps families with children. But I also think that we need to think a lot more about sort of pre-distribution programs rather than redistribution programs. Um, and to, um, you know, think about ways, you know, we, we know how minimum wages work and we're you know, having growing evidence that these can be quite effective. Um, without uh, employment declines at the wages levels that they're currently being um, uh, provided. But that only goes so far. That's helping at the very bottom, but it's not helping sort of up beyond that. So, um, you know, the, the decline of unions in the United States are a large part of uh, the, the, the sort of um, uh, worker versus firm uh, loss of bargaining power on the side of, of workers. And so I think there's a lot of interesting ideas out there about how to um, improve the firm side of bargaining through kind of um, industry level wage setting that you might start with groups like nurses or other sorts of groups to try to see how we can start to do more through the, mar through the labor market rather than all uh, on redistribution. And I guess I should just, you know, uh, David's graph showing about the full-time work flattening in the in Canada and the contrast with the United States of the sort of declining employment rates. I think what's actually more troubling to the decline in employment rates is actually the decline in wages and earnings. So one of the questions in the chat about, you know, why is Silicon Valley so pro-UBI? Uh, is it all about the gig economy? I think the evidence suggests that the gig economy is not really showing up much in employment. It's just not big enough on a national level in the US. But what we seem, and Darone and a lot of others have contributed to this work is that the, the increasing sort of automation and technical change, which um, you know Silicon Valley has been a big driver of, is less problematic for jobs but much more problematic for good paying jobs. So it contributes to declines in earnings as a driver in a more powerful way than it contributes to decline in the number of jobs. So I don't know, those are some general thoughts. Yeah. David, you wanna weigh in on- uh, I'll be quick, I, 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 yeah. I, I agree with both Miles and, and Hillary. The, the, 
answer I think lies in the in the wage setting part of the of the economy and how we affect that. Um, just as another point, again, a difference between Canada and the U.S. Uh, in you know since about the early 2000s, when U.S. wages at the low end were falling, they're actually rising in Canada. That, that probably had a lot to do with the resource boom, and to some degree, that meant that we got some elbow room to work with. It may be that that elbow room is going to come to an end soon, although wages have stayed relatively strong. Um, so I, you know, it, it's again, we're not we're not facing the same issues that the U.S. are in this context, but we do, as, as Miles pointed out, it's a long-term persistent problem. I mean, yes, that line is flat, but it still says 35% of people are in what you might call precarious work, and we need to address that, but, but my feeling is the same as the other two, the place to address that is in policies that directly address what's happening in the labor market. Yeah. Um, what do you let think? Me, uh, you know, since moving to France, I have uh, really, become much more in the camp of we have to make sure the labor market is working properly and pre-distribution policies are key. So I'm just echoing what you guys have said, right? But but uh, it is, it's just too much heavy lifting to ask the tax and transfer program to do the whole thing. Um, also, there's a different political baggage. You know, none of us are political scientists, but there's a different political baggage attached to tax and transfer programs. And there is to uh, having better paying and better quality jobs. I mean, it's, it goes back to what Miles said about these essential workers, or at least it came on the screen. I'm not sure he had a chance to say it. Essential workers who we all recognize now as essential after, um, after the COVID crisis that, that basically had very poor pay and, and poor hours and, and not much control, right? And we recognize them as essential. Now that we're, well, I won't even say that. When we get through uh, the crisis, will we actually take an opportunity to turn those jobs for essential workers into, into decent ones instead of... Uh, instead of the ones that, that they're experiencing now in, in recognition of what happened. So, so uh, I'm now at the point where balance across uh, tax and transfer programs, which remain hugely important, but also pre-distribution or whatever market policies that improve the quality of existing jobs. I think that, that has to be uh, just, a, just as big a part of income protection. Um, we're getting short on time, but uh, we have a bunch of BI questions which we could go to, but I did promise I would get back to uh, the gender aspect of this coming out of COVID because none of the policies uh, we talked about really target those issues that much, right? Everybody's going back to school or people who have who go to school are going back to school this week. A lot of it is happening online. Um, that's putting a lot of pressure on families, it's putting a lot more pressure on women than uh, men in many cases. Uh, is there a way to tweak some of these support programs to, to help with that? Is that something we should be thinking about or is that unique to this problem? I don't know if anyone has some thoughts on that. Well, I think on the income protection side, if the policies are working well, that does, it shouldn't matter um, what the gender composition of the workers that are losing work and are um, at home um, uh, temporarily. I think that what is unique about this setting is maybe the, the need to try to figure out a solution to the childcare problem for those that are expecting to be working from home whilst also taking care of their children who are either in school or too young to be in school. And to me, that feels like maybe the special layer um, that, um, that is needed uh, in this context. Um, anyone else? Want to weigh in? No, I, I, I agree with that. I think it, I think it is about childcare. That's, that's where we need to be putting the emphasis for this. Yeah. Childcare in general, childcare in, uh, in this setting is tough, right? I'm not sure we have that worked out yet. Childcare in general has always been a problem in this setting. It's particularly difficult. It's okay to leave some questions that we can't answer. Uh, we got the warning that it's time for me to thank you. Uh, great panel guys. Uh, the only thing that would have made it better if I was actually there with you, but it's nice to be able to do it without having to travel a long way to, to do it. Um, very interesting. And I'm going to turn it back over to Keith uh, to, to wrap things up. Oh, well, let me add my thanks to those from uh, Mark, uh, to our speakers, three great speakers. <clears throat> Excuse me, but I also want to thank Mark for um, <clears throat> 
moderating such an extremely informative and stimulating session. <clears throat> I want to just take a moment to uh, note the program, uh, the sessions that are coming up for the rest of this week. It was notable that uh, people in this session uh, uh, stress the extent to which income security can't carry the full load. And <clears throat> therefore, we're going to have to look to childcare, we're going to have to look to market programs. Those are precisely the issues we'll drill down on in the next two sessions. <clears throat> one on social care and one on income uh, labor market protections. So tomorrow, our session will uh, focus on rethinking social protection and the care economy. And it's very clear that the pandemic has highlighted a number of weaknesses in our systems of social care. Families have had to juggle working at home and the lack of child care. We have seen perhaps more dramatically the vulnerability of elderly Canadians in care, particularly in long-term uh, healthcare contexts. We've also seen the vulnerability of care workers, often uh, <clears throat> women, often racialized and immigrant women, and they have carried a very heavy burden in this context. And so tomorrow, we will dig down onto the question of whether, given the pandemic and what it's demonstrated so clearly, whether it's possible to think about building stronger systems of social care uh, and valuing perhaps more strongly the per per people who provide it. <clears throat> For that session, we have three great speakers. Andrea Doucette, who's Canada Research Chair in Gender, Work and Care at Brock University. Ito Peng, who's Canada Research Chair in Global Social Policy at the University of Toronto. And Samir Sinha, Director of Geriatrics at Mount Sinai and the University Health Network Hospitals in Toronto. <clears throat> Our moderator will be Janet Menard, who is Deputy Minister of the Ministry of Children, Community and Social Services. So it looks like a great session and it sounds like it follows perfectly from the discussion today. <clears throat> so please join us. Please uh, sign on using the unique URL that you've received in the confirmation email. It gets, gets you into all the sessions, simply. Before closing, I would like to acknowledge and thank our major sponsors, Employment and Social Development Canada, the Ministry of Children, Community and Social Services in Ontario, and the City of Toronto. Without their support, we'd not be able to bring such a high level conversation about critical issues led by leading experts to this large Canadian gathering. So we would, we, 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 excuse me, we acknowledge and thank our sponsors most thankfully. Finally, we'll see you tomorrow. Stay safe. <laughs>